Welcome, everybody, to the last session of the uh, Congress. Uh, a warm welcome also to the audience online, which can participate via social media. Uh, we will talk in the next uh, 60, maybe a bit more minutes, to, uh, about health security, the concepts and the practical implications. And I have um, a fantastic panel here with me, which I'd like to introduce very briefly. And then we um, get started. We have here Mr. Bergner, um, which is the coordinator for the foreign policy dimensions of global health issues with the German Federal um, Foreign Office in Germany here. Thank you for being with us. Um, you have experience in Yemen, Middle East, Northern Africa. You were in, stationed in Moscow and in Abu Dhabi, which is quite a wide range of uh, countries. Uh, we have here Christian, Dr. Christian Hagenmiller. Um, he is a medical doctor, research coordinator for health security interface with the German Institute for Defense and Strategic Studies in Hamburg. And we have here Heather Pagano, conflict and humanitari humanitarianism advisor from MSF in Brussels. Thank you for being with us here today. So we will talk about health security, uh, which is uh, there are many, many attempts to define this concept, which, is, which turns out to not really being defined. There was a lot of attempts, but there's no definition that is widely accepted. So we will talk about like, how do we understand it and what does it mean in the field. Um, we will also talk about that Germany's um, interpretation and Germany's um, measurements in, in this field. And we will also talk about MSF approaches um, and understandings. So I would like to give you, all of you, the same question to start, um, which is, and maybe Mr. Bergner, you, you would like to start to tell us about how you understand health security and also what it what it, in your opinion, has for, um, practical implications. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the intro introduction and uh, thank you for having this panel. I think the question of health and security is a very important one. And it's important to get a common understanding what we mean by talking about this issue. Um, one reason or one frame of uh, the contemporary situation which gives uh, the background for it is certainly that humanitarian crises um, which are related to war or caused by war have doubled sin since 2013. That has been written in recently published report uh, on the SDG action plan in New York in September where it was uh, presented first time officially. And that certainly sets the frame for the for the question. Um, when it comes to a clear definition, I would like to cite you uh, the definition the WHO is using in its um, World Health Report. There it says, global public health security is defined as the activities required, both proactive and reactive, to minimize vulnerability to acute public health events that endanger the collective health of populations living across geographical regions and international boundaries, which means in the end protection against diseases. However, when we discuss with different actors in the field, you will find different interpretations and definitions. I would say there's no universally accepted definition of what exactly is health security. It depends very much on who is using it and it, in which context it is being used. So there are quite different aspects to it. You have the aspect of uh, safety of the population from diseases. You have the aspect of safety of delivery uh, of, of medical care. Um, safety of medical staff, et cetera, et cetera. All these are in question with fragile settings. So the situation in which you have nowadays 
um, humanitarian crises are very different and they are becoming more and more complex with different actors involved and with the interaction between security, environment, um, sometimes industry and others. Um, so in general, I would say it's about healthcare in different security settings. And when we look at this, I would rather say instead of using a term which might not find universal agreement, let's keep it to health and security, which allows us to look more concretely at the situation and look at the different roles of the different actors in the field and their, their tasks. However, what should be in common, and there I come to a common line which we might agree upon, that is the common thing for all of the actors is the respect for international humanitarian law, which is clearly the respect for humanitarian principles. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much also for highlighting um, the international humanitarian law and the right to health. Um, Christian, would you like to uh, continue with your understanding? <clears throat> well, um, just first of all, I'm also a military doctor, uh, so I'm here not in uniform, but um, in civilian, uh, just, uh, just to uh, disclose that. Uh, and I'm working already about this issue over the last 10 years in different settings, um, and one of that was in, uh, also for NATO in, at the um, joint analysis lessons learned center so where we were looking um, very deeply how <clears throat> how the military or the security actors are having an impact on health systems and um, uh, in the good or in the bad way and uh, so that we came up with some recommendations and um, because that was a long-term project um, with multiple actors, um, we try to be as comprehensive as, as possible. Um, there was um, a kind of theme that came across all the time, and uh, without being or trying to be too pathetic, um, health has the notion of being, well, um, well, also humanitarian, to be altruistic, uh, to have, uh, let's say, uh, to, to, to follow one of the finest values that uh, human beings can, can follow. Um, on the one side, uh, with moral and ethics uh, behind that. And on the other side, we have the security uh, um, concept or approach that is, um, well, <clears throat> let's say very, much ba uh, need based um, it's it's much more what is um, uh, is it for us and um, um, that is linked just to purely survival and and also the, the advantage that our group or society might have also against uh, over another one so <clears throat> there was a kind of labeling health is good security is bad and that kind of notion came all the time However, I don't see a really clear line where it is. It's so inter interwoven and, um, and uh, so that we had to uh, come up uh, with uh, different um, uh, pushing uh, uh, to, to learn and to, to um, identify those, uh, those comprehensive civil military concepts which is beyond military, it is security concepts. Um, and here we had also, for example, you were also the part of that, um, 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 uh, try to, to uh, come up with, um, 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 uh, first to come up with a definition, um, what is the security, what we mean, uh, what is the health that we want to protect. and. Um, and I also want to maybe to read uh, one of the um, uh, definition that we, let's say, proposed um, <clears throat> that is very um, um, close to that from from the uh, from the WHO, but it's a little bit more. Uh, there is a little tweak in there, and it's it, it is because um, the collective ability to mitigate health threats. 
that have the potential to destabilize society, states, and regions. So here we have the notion that health might have an impact on security. And then we continue with uh, global health security has the goal um, to establish resilient health system in order to promote peace and security for all. So that is really that health is becoming also a tool that is promoting health, that is promoting stability, and that requires to be protected. So by whom? Okay, this is another story. Yeah, thank you very much. We will come to that later. Also the role of the military in, in health security and in fragile situations. Heather, would you like to continue? So thank you very much for having me here today. Um, so for MSF, how do we see global health security? For us, we see health security as a commitment to secure and improve the health of all individuals, all populations, particularly the most vulnerable, whoever and wherever they may be. That seems pretty obvious, but it can be quite complicated. Since West Africa and the big Ebola outbreak there, the global health security lens has propelled health into the hard policy arena, into an issue, in, exactly into the security debate. And now we see things that are, that are positive topics like epidemics and antimicrobial resistance have been propelled onto this arena. They're brought up at the G7 now, whereas before health issues were always relegated to minister of health meetings sort of thing. It's now brought up as, a, as an important topic. So it's a positive step to see health highlighted as an important issue worthy of attention and funding. But what does it look like on the ground and what kind of discussions do we hear about it happening? What we see is that often global health security discussions circle around the priorities of donor countries, which are not always aligned with the needs, most urgent needs of the sick. So let's consider, for, as an example, the investment in DRC this year for the Ebola outbreak versus the ongoing measles outbreak, now the largest in DRC's history. So there's been over 3,000 cases of Ebola with 2,000 deaths. There's been nearly 200,000 cases of measles with 4,000 deaths, twice as many as Ebola. 230,000 people have been vaccinated for Ebola, 4.6 million for measles. The international budget for Ebola, $460 million. For measles, $8 million. So. The other hand, what do we see? We also see that this sort of terminology around health, threats, protection, stability, this sort of language used around it can create an atmosphere also of fear. And intertwining health into a security agenda can divert attention from health and the core principle of health as a basic human right. People are not bio threats on two legs. They are not people to, they are not a, a threat to be feared. They're people who deserve help and not only whenever it threatens wealthy countries. I think um, often in these health security debates, there's very little to no discussion of the unequal distribution of infectious disease burden, public health crises, and their vulnerabilities to them. And we have learned, especially since West Africa, that epidemics need to be fought at the heart of them, not whenever the, you know, West Africa could not cope with the Ebola outbreak alone, despite many calls for help, but no he external help came until we wealthy na nations felt under threat. And as a medical organization, we do not accept that patients will be treated only if they pose a security threat to the most powerful. So also, framing health as a security threat can then provoke a response that's about maintaining order, not healing people. So for us, primarily securing health is not about securitizing health, but I'll talk a bit more about that later. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much also for your, for your more concrete examples already. We'll dive into that um, a little bit deeper. Um, what I, as an academic, I love to talk about definitions. That's what we do all the time. Um, but I think it's, it's uh, important to talk about what are the um, real life experience of the people in the field. And I would love to hear more about that. Um, and also you highlighted two words, for all. And I see a lot of um, despair when we talk about what is global health security, for whom, and from what um, do we want security. And I think the for all is kind of, it's very important in the, in the debate. Um, Mr. Bergner, um, can you give us some idea what, what is Germany doing in this field? What are health security measurements? And what is Germany's approach to health security? 
Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, we, we rather tend to use the, the term health and security. Um, one aspect was mentioned already. Um, Germany brought up the issue of health, not under the headline security, to the leaders of G7 and G20 in order to, to strengthen the ability and capacities to build up health systems. Um, there are two major fields where we are active at the moment. One are the activities in the UN Security Council, and the other activities um, are in the field of humanitarian assistance. When it comes to the Security Council, I have to um, say that Germany is, uh, for two years, 2019-2020, a non-permanent member of the Security Council. And with regard to, to health and security, Germany brought up uh, certain, or brings up, certain sensitive health aspects in the context of security questions at the UN uh, Security Council, as there are safety of medical staff and institutions, as there are um, humanitarian access, implementation of sexual and reproductive health rights for survivors of sexualized violence in conflicts. To the first point, we raised the question of attacks against health facilities and um, medical teams a couple of times, not only in the Security Council. We did this before, we do it now, and we will do it afterwards. Um, everybody knows about the cases we had in the last years, be it targeted attacks against hospitals in Syria. We had it in Yemen. We have it in a different way in Eastern Congo, where hospitals or health sites have been attacked by the population. So we raised this at different levels, but also at the Security Council. In addition, with regard to Syria, Germany supported in the Security Council the effort to clar clarify with medical institutions in Idlib, this is a concrete case, uh, how they could have become targets of military attacks. A board of inquiry could be set up in the UN, UN Security Council, and we will we'll follow up on this issue. Another important issue we followed in the uh, UN Security Council is the question of humanitarian law. Here we had an initiative starting in this April this year, jointly of uh, the German Foreign Minister and the French Foreign Minister, Mr. Le Drian, to put humanitarian access on the agenda of the UN United Nations Security Council. The idea is to strengthen humanitarian law, not to change or to add something, but rather to find better ways of implementing the existing humanitarian law. Um, by the meantime, this September, where we endorsed our, our initiative during the opening of this year's General Assembly, um, already 43 countries worldwide have endorsed this initiative. And of course, we have the, the third initiative, which I mentioned earlier, the, the initiative on sexual violence in conflict. We introduced a resolution in the Security Council, which is number 2467. Um, and this is also a resolution survivor-oriented uh, and survivor-centered approach. And this is actually the goal of all our initiatives, to put the people in the focus. And that brings me to the other aspect of German activities in the field of humanitarian assistance. Here we have a broad field of activities. And as I mentioned, as in the last years, humanitarian crises have doubled in a certain period um, of the last seven years. I can add that the humanitarian assistance of Germany has, is, has grown tenfold in the last years since 
2012, where we spend about 158 million euro on humanitarian existence. It is by 2018 by 1.58 billion. About 15 to 20 percent of that amount is healthcare assistance. I think this is an important issue which we try to follow up not only by talking about the questions of health and security, but also by driving the, the issue of, of humanitarian assistance. Um, Minister Maas, who was recently in Eastern Congo, not only to get an update on the question of the Ebola outbreak in those uh, provinces in Eastern Congo, but also he visited the hospital of uh, Nobel Prize winner Dr. Mukwege, who um, has a very, um, very special project. Um, he is taking care about survivors of sexual conflict, uh, sexual um, uh, violence in conflict. He has built up this hospital, but he has also built a foundation with which he works in different areas, and we are supporting this foundation with, uh, uh, in, in different projects. Let me just end by another aspect, which is also of growing importance in the international sphere, but as well for our humanitarian assistance. This is specifically the question of mental health. When, and this is, of course, in the specific situation we were talking about, health crisis in fragile or war settings, you have a growing number of, of victims and survivors which are, have to be treated um, in the area of mental health. I would, would stop by that. Thank you very much. So I heard uh, agenda setting as a very strong topic um, in the international fora and also in the UN Security Council. Um, you talked about um, spending for humanitarian assistance and mental health, which is for me a newer topic in the discourse of um, health security. Um, Christian, would you like to give us some insights on your opinion, what kind of security aspects um, are there in, um, in health emergencies or in the field of, of health security? And what is your opinion on the, on the benefits um, of the conf uh, on, on the military in, in those situations? <clears throat> Maybe just to add um, a little bit on that um, about global health security, Mr. Bergner um, just um, uh, picked, uh, described the whole variety of, of uh, what f might fall into that. However, we know that um, if we talk about global health security, we automatically think about epidemics. Um, and, um, and, and this is certainly a reflex that we have to um, well, work on that this is global health security is much more than just epidemics. So this is uh, one thing. Nevertheless, um, uh, another, another, another uh, topic or uh, point that I just want to make um, is that um, we fall very likely into, not in a trap, but uh, in, into the notion that um, <clears throat> we, with global health and security, is just about saving lives, which is the fact, and, and, and which is fine. However, this means um, we we uh, have the tendency just to make uh, to to have numbers here. How many lives have we saved, or could we have saved, um, by neglecting a lot of uh, other different um, uh, um, environmental factors like uh, well, uh, dignity of life. Um, how are they in this area? Um, the biodiversity that is interrelated in the whole, in the, uh, just in, in the survival and in the environmental protection, climate change, everything in this, the, the topic of this, this conference uh, fits wonderful into that. So that I have personally, I feel a little bit that a kind of problem that we are, uh, that we are narrowing too much just on, uh, the human, um, on the human piece and that we have maybe to expand even if it hurts mentally, or not mentally, but um, intellectually, because it's becoming much more complex and it, it's 
against that what we want to do. We want to have easy answers to complex, uh, yeah, complex I, um, questions. I would strongly disagree because where's the difference then between global health and health security when all is the same? But, um, but coming back to the question, maybe you can also give us some insights. When do we need military forces in health security or in health emergencies? And when maybe not? <laughs> well, um, uh, the military has um, a kind of uh, well history being involved in 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 health um, activities in conflict, um, and that can be read in all in the internet. What are the pro and cons? Um, and definitely, one of the uh, the lessons that we have learned in NATO missions is that getting less involved in direct healthcare, providing healthcare, being just passive, supporting uh, the, the, the system uh, just behind. So this is one of the big lessons that NATO and many NATO nations have adopted, uh, which I think it's a big step forward. Um, uh, and by saying that, uh, the military, um, uh, they do not task themselves doing something. They are being tasked by the government. Um, actually, maybe by the Ministry of Defense, because we have a uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because um, um, the military is just a tool of, of, um, of, of politics. And so we are getting tasks, um, and we try to well, do our best uh, in, in, in doing that. But and to answer your question, where would be uh, the best way to, to be engaged? Um, it is just, uh, for example, um, we have capabilities, um, research capabilities, um, information capabilities that can be, uh, let's say, comprehensively um, um, shared um, with uh, um, let's say with other other institutions, organizations, choose in in, in the support. Um, we have, of course, um, the, um, the whole logistic capability that can be very interesting for an initial uh, in the initial phase. Um, um, there is also another theme of uh, health security that we haven't touched is just um, the uh, deliberately um, changing um, or exposing of, of um, bio, bio threats where here there is also a field where the military or security actors can be, can be very active uh, and also supportive. Um, the military shouldn't be at all um, proactive or let's say um, be in, in first line. They are always like in the, in the Oslo principles or humanitarian principles, always on just on, on request if a certain capacity is exhausted. And uh, this is uh, also something that the John Hopkins University with the Health Security Center or Center for Health Security uh, also um, describing global catastrophic uh, um, um, risks, um, bio-risks. Um, that means that um, that kind of global catastrophic impact is exceeding the international and also the, the, the private sector capability to cope with that. So in here we have certainly also a situation to see who can help, and uh, we need to make it just happen um, that that kind of module that is very sensitive fits into the whole, um, let's say, concept. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, what you said, this, the sensitive part um, with the concept. Heather, um, would, could you highlight, the, in your opinion, what are the risks of health security as a concept, and what does it mean in the field? And maybe there are also um, benefits by using the concept or the frame um, for MSF. So I'd like to just focus really quickly on the notion of when, when and where for the military in, um, in outbreaks. I think it's a really interesting question. Why? 
there are fairly clear guidelines for when the military intervenes um, in natural disasters. Normally it's logistics um, assets, especially at a country at peace. So if there's a massive earthquake in Nepal and NGOs need to use a helicopter to get a military hel helicopter to reach a far-flung pl far place, that happens and it's fine and it's gov governed by the Oslo guidelines. In armed conflict, we have international humanitarian law that governs and humanitarian principles of, of how we relate to military forces. In outbreaks, it's, be, it's kind of a funny in-between third category that doesn't have necessarily very clear guidelines on what the military should and should not do in outbreaks. Um, and why is that important? Because we know really well that in infectious disease outbreaks, the effectiveness of the response rests on whether or not the community perceives the response as legitimate and trustworthy. And some parts of the world, military or police, are viewed very favorably. And when people are scared, they want the, the forces to come in to support them. And other parts of the world, especially those in civil conflict, the military is, or the police can be a threatening force. And the use of the military to, for, for example, use coercion to compel compliance with public health measures can pose serious problems to the, the perception of the response. We see that in Ebola today in, in Congo. Um, the message has been consistent and clear from the population. They don't trust the Ebola responders for a variety of different reasons, um, historical and political reasons, as well as um, corruption concerns, et cetera. As mistrust has grown, the Ebola response relied more heavily on security forces that are not trusted in an area that's been in conflict for 25 years. Then the use of force to compel people to comply with uh, public health measures, like police ads, vaccination sites, um, this sort of thing, then further confirms their suspicions. And so it can drive patients underground rather than gaining their trust. So the question is, is the use of coercion useful? Will it, is it medically valid and, and necessary? And does it work to stop an outbreak? In our experience, not. The use of, armed, of police and armed forces to compel people um, tends to alienate them and is counterproductive to controlling the outbreak. Um, so coercing people to do a safe burial can, can scare them. I mean, in, in Ebola, people have told us, we don't, is, this, is Ebola really real? Because in, in, a, in a cholera treatment center, there's no guys with guns. When you do a measles vaccination, you don't bring the police with you. Why do you need it for this, this disease you call Ebola? It's a fair enough question. Um, but then, again, you get into a vicious cycle. Because they're afraid, then, they, then the use of the police becomes necessary. And there's no problem with using the police, if, of course. In, um, we respect the role of the police in uh, maintaining order. But the actions of law enforcement have to remain distinct from a public health response. That's the key. Mixing those two things causes big, big problems. Um, so that was that. The other question what was another. I lost my train of thought. I got on a bit of a kick. Um, I think you did great on the pros and cons. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, maybe another question for all of you. Um, today, uh, like in the morning, we also talked in the. Maybe some of you were in the Ebola session. Trust was community engagement. That's that's the key. We have. This experience, we have drugs, we have vaccines um, right now in the field for, for Ebola. Where's the problem? Why don't we, like, where's the progress? What can we do? Mr. Wagner, would you like to start? Okay, yeah, I think here, here we come to the concrete situation, which is very important. I think Heather um, uh, quite clearly outlined we have to stick to the humanitarian principles. Um, so which means that each and every actor needs, first of all, the clear-cut rules, which were mentioned earlier. And with regard to the humanitarian principles and medical aid, it is clear that medical aid is a separate issue from military issue. Military can play an important role. And when it comes to um, Eastern Congo, you have different actors in the field. You have, of course, the Congolese army, and you have the MONUSCO, the UN mission. And this mission has a clear mandate. And the task of MONUSCO is certainly not easy in a very difficult setting of a war-torn country with lots of different militias acting. And not all of them 
it's very obvious what their aims are. They are very different militias and, and, and armed groups. Some are working for, for industrial companies. Others have a nationalist aim. Uh, so it's not easy to get, get along in this situation. It has been mentioned one of the uh, key problems in Eastern Congo is the question of trust of the population. So I don't know what has been discussed this morning when we were discussing, um, when you were discussing the question of Ebola in, in Eastern Congo. The situation we have is that we are in a much better situation now than we were five years ago in Western Africa. We have a vaccine that seems to work and we have now much better medicamentation even to support healing. There has been, I think, up to 250,000 um, uh, vaccinate, uh, people being vaccinated in, in, in Congo. This is a great help. The medicamentation which we have nowadays, if it is being applied within a very short period after um, being infected, within two to four days, it might reduce uh, strongly the death rate. Up to now, we have a death rate of about 67% of those affected. If the medicamentation we have nowadays can be applied quickly, this rate can be reduced to less than 10%. However, and here it comes to the core problem, the trust of the population. The population does not trust the government which is far away in about 2,500 2, kilometers in Kinshasa. There is a mistrust against any kind of military actors in the field. So whatever we have to do, we have to take into account these feelings and fears of the population. If we don't do that, we won't be successful in, in uh, really driving back Ebola and getting control of the outbreak. So coming back to the role of MONUSCO and, and, and this UN mission in, in the area, the role of MONUSCO should be to stabilize the area, but it should not be to directly company medical um, activities. So in general, to stabilize the area with MONUSCO is, is a way to help to enable humanitarian actors, and that should be the aim, to enable humanitarian actors to work independently in the field to help the population. That should be the aim. Thank you. Thank you. Christian. With so, many, so much experience, drugs, vaccines, where's the problem? Um, well, <clears throat> uh, the problem is, okay, now me again uh, being a military, uh, answering this question, I see you would never ask a military, hey, how do we do, uh, cope with uh, diabetes or tuberculosis? So it is certainly when, um, if you ask, if you come to the military and, and, and try to get them involved, is because there is another, another problem, another layer that is, uh, stopping the normal uh, the system or the system which are in place or should be in place are not working. And basically, most of that are fear-driven, um, which is um, um, the factor why you want, you, you have the feeling, okay, we need to have, we need, we need security somehow there. Um, the problem in, in areas like in Congo is um, access first. Uh, and then if, um, uh, and also denied access. Um, and also uh, the other thing is uh, the availability of uh, the, um, of the vaccines. So um, we knew, we know that um, the Ebola vaccines in the, uh, just um, uh, the last year when there were very small samples, um, there, was, there was a kind of, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, there was a wish to protect that kind of vaccines because there were just four very specific persons. Um, the other thing is also the acceptance of, of the vaccines if we, if we remain on, on, on epidemics. Uh, 
it, we have this problem with um, polio. Um, we are so close to, to, to eradi uh, eradicate polio, but we have an ac uh, acceptance problem and also an access problem to get the vaccines to those, to those areas. And um, yes, uh, is the military has their uh, uh, a role to play, um, and we, here we open uh, certainly a, a big history box, um, a, a military and polio campaign uh, in, in Afghanistan in Pakistan. N nevertheless, I would say no, only if there is a very very specific role to get a vaccine from A to B, to pr that that has to be protected or if the military with their institution might be have facilities, capabilities to, to uh, produce vaccines that are not commercially interested. So because this is the biggest problem in, 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 in infection, uh, so in producing vaccines is that they are uh, n not in the, uh, in the interest of the pharma industry because um, uh, there is that kind of, um, uh, let's say, a n lack of incentive uh, where military laboratories, they are not uh, that driven. So uh, here is, there is, there, is a, a, there is that kind of option that how to integrate them. Uh, yesterday, when I prepared my my talking points here, I looked at the WHO website and clicked on the health uh, emergency news, and just checking like what do they call health emergency? And it was polio, it was cholera, it was Ebola, and I was like, okay, that's like only infectious disease are called health emergencies. And I also like Mr. Bergner mentioned mental health as a non communicable disease, but it's, I think it's like the perspective. Um, Heather, would you like to share your, your thoughts on where, where's the real problem? It's a super good point about mental health, in fact. Um, where's the problem? We have tools that we would have dreamed of in West Africa today that are available in DRC. Um, a vaccine that works, treatments that work, and yet the outbreak keeps going on and on and on, and the population are suffering. Um, and why? Why is it not under control? Well, to vaccinate, you have to know who to vaccinate. And people are afraid, and they don't want necessarily to come forward to be vaccinated or to be part of the Ebola response. Um, I think all the innovation in the world can't substitute for people's trust once it's been broken. So how do you rebuild trust? What does it look like? You go slow, and you go and listen to people, what they really want. So I'll give a, a positive um, example, actually, because I'm, I'm always the bearer of bad news. <laughs> um, I'll give a positive example. So there's a village in, uh, in the Ebola response that was a really difficult part of, uh, of, of the Kivus, um, chronic conflict in that area. The community was super resistant uh, to anything Ebola-related. They did not want the response, the repost, as they call it, anywhere near them, essentially. It took us a few months before the community was willing to start an Ebola center. So we built trust super gradually asking them what they wanted. So first they asked for water, so we built wells. Then they asked for pre free primary health care, so we started supporting the health center. And then finally they were ready to start discussing what an Ebola center would look like with us. This took a few months, this is not a fast process. But the community was super involved in building the, in the, health, uh, the Ebola center. They wanted a permanent structure, no tents, and they even picked out this special sort of linoleum, I wish I had a picture of it, um, this sort of green linoleum patterned thing for the walls so that people would feel like it was more of a homey feeling inside these, I and mean, we have Ebola, it's not fun, right? So they want something to make it a bit more hospitable and more humane for them, that's what they asked for. And even though this part's been successful and the facility has, um, has, has been working fairly well, um, we also ask everyone who comes in for their consent to be there. You wouldn't believe how many people were brought in that was not, was not with their full consent, which is against medical ethics, by the way, to force people to receive treatment when they don't want it. Um, we had to fight this battle regularly in Congo. Um, but still, keeping the trust and the collaboration is an ongoing effort, um, and especially there's continuing security issues in the area. It's not an easy place to work. Um, but what remains really key is that we work on a negotiated access model, especially in fragile conflict locations. What does that mean? It means that we have to go in and explain who we are, why we're there, and that we're not part of the external issues that are happening, the, the fights that, that are happening there. This is really difficult in a global health environment. Why? 
because global health architecture and public health responses are designed to be led by the state government. And in places in, uh, around the world, that makes a lot of sense. In other places, the government is not the first person that you trust. Um, even in my own country, I can imagine if there were, you know, th there would be some pushback in certain parts of my country if the president was the face of the response to an infectious disease outbreak in certain towns, I could tell you. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that can create a lot of issues. And, and really, almost more than, in because in conflict, you're also working on an acceptance model. You want people to trust you so they don't, they don't attack you. But you have an extra added layer in an infectious disease outbreak. Not only do you want them not to attack you, you want them to come forward for treatment because you don't want them to, to slip away and inadvertently infect other people around them and for the outbreak to continue and for people to suffer. But people aren't stupid and they can sense when they smell a rat whenever they think you're not there really to help them and you have other motives in mind. And that is the bit we all have to work on, which means we have to focus on the patients, you have to focus on what it is that they want, and you have to be very clear and honest with them whenever they have issues with the response and with what's going on. And that's really difficult when you have a multitude of actors on the field um, and you're trying to explain to them why you're there, but you're caught up also in perceptions of, of how the wider response is working. And that there's no easy answer. I could tell you we have had numerous debates um, about what this, what, how can we do better? What more can we do um, on the field? And yeah, th there's a reason why these are some of the most extreme places on earth and I, the, where MSF is working. Um, the global health security debates often talk a lot about preparedness in, in, in these areas and how to build health systems. So even earlier this year, there was a big global health security conference in, um, in Australia, and uh, I was invited to go along. And so they, they were really surprised to see MSF there. They're like, oh, that's it's normally a preparedness, sort of getting health systems, but that's not your business. I'm like, no, it's true. It's not normally our, our thing. But we wanted to come along to understand what does this look like in practice? What are you discussing? And how can we understand what this looks like going forward? And global health security and, and building health systems in, um, and backing the state in places that are stable makes a lot of sense. And of course, that's important. Um, but it's really complicated in, in the more difficult parts of the world where we're present, which is why I think it's important that we attend these sorts of things to bring a reality check of what it looks like in these places. Thank you very much. Uh, I heard uh, trust building means being trustworthy. Um, I would like to open up uh, and let you engage with the panel. Um, I can't see you very good. I will collect like two, three questions and then give it to the panel. I see a question there and there. And there. Three male questions. Maybe we can also have some questions for females. <laughs> Next round. Hi, um, I'm Rob, MSF UK, and Lancer Countdown. I've, I've done some global health security work with WHO and others. Um, I just wanted to uh, agree with your concern, Heather, around the disparity in funding of measles outbreaks and the, the Ebola outbreak. But at the same time, just for us to be a little bit careful about being too critical about global health security um, interventions, which aim to, you know, particularly around preparedness, but also response. Because, of course, what those interventions are trying to do is really prevent these kind of really large pandemics, which have consequences far beyond um, the, the kind of mortality, but can have, really have the potential to uh, destroy economies of countries. And as we know, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Boards, which is the board convened by World Bank, IFRC, um, WHO, recently put out a report just saying the world is not prepared for what is probably going to come at some point, which is an airborne infection, which is going to have devastating consequences. Um, so that's just my first point. My, my second point is that the global health security agenda, again, I'm, I'm using this in the kind of WHO term, preparedness and response to in, in infectious diseases, is it's an agenda that's very much owned or, or yeah, owned by the global north. So Public Health England, Robert Cook Institute in Germany, U US CDC, um, are really putting a lot of effort into, into strengthening global health security. Um, I think what we need to see is a shift of power to the global south and to see organizations like Africa CDC, Nigeria CDC, Ethiopia, P et cetera, taking on more of a gender. And perhaps then we can feel a bit more comfortable about how those resources are allocated. Thanks. Thank you. 
I didn't hear a real question, but I, I guess uh, Heather and all the other panelists want to answer in a second. Um, the next question was here. Uh, yes, uh, Florian Westphal of MSF Germany, and I'm afraid it's also going to be a bit more of a comment, but perhaps the panel feels like reacting to it. And I struggle with this term to an extent and what it implies, because what we're always talking about is the role of security forces in a health response. But actually, this term, in a way, from we just had a session on Syria here, just the, before this panel in the same room. And there, the issue of global health security is actually how do you securitize health against armed actors? Uh, so you know, you, you, so I'm kind of wondering whether that if we really wanted to look at this term slightly differently and say, can we not look at it in terms of enhancing the security of healthcare and healthcare providers? Something Mr. Bergner re referred to when he was talking about IHL, uh, when he was talking about attacks on medical structures, and then look at what particularly we can do to influence security forces that their behaviour changes in a way that it actually supports and securitizes and protects medical workers and medical structures and medical care, rather than the opposite. We also spoke about sexual violence. And if you look at sexual violence in Congo, maybe it's not an epidemic, but sometimes it almost looks like one. I'm not a medical person. Um, there, it is actually a phenomenon enormously widespread, continuous for many, many years now, uh, which at the root of which are armed actors, including the government army. And so maybe we should just sort of reconfigure the meaning of this term a bit if we want to look at it from a patient perspective. Thanks. And we collect one more. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Andreas Wolf, Medico International. I'm happy to see that, that this debate has gone much beyond this very narrow epidemic, epidemic outre, outbreak uh, uh, discussion. What, what I wanted to, to add on, and, and this is also something that, that refers to the, the numbers and, and funding, funding perspective of global health security. Um, in that term, if, if what, what we have not touched much is this, this resilient health systems approach that came across. And my fear is that, that these initiatives that have started at the, the level of WHO to really better coordinate responses in um, and, and also try to strengthen countries with, um, with epidemic outbreaks to really invest into their health system so that health security issues of the population is really taking into account that this remains a very technical and like from an epidemic, epidemiological surveillance uh, perspective. And I wonder how much the, the experiences already from 2015 with the Ebola outbreak, you, you see that these, um, these, these terms of, of health system strengthening has really got into this resilient health system discourse. That will, thank you very much. Thanks. So we have uh, preparedness, ownership, power shift. Uh, we have reframing um, and also securing um, per health personnel and infrastructure, and priority setting um, and health system strengthening. Heather, would you like to start? It's, um, so I'll start really um, with the securitizing point because I think it's an interesting idea. Um, I also work quite a lot on um, on issues of international humanitarian law, counterterrorism context. I think many of you were also in the panel earlier today, um, and the sort of legal gray zones that exist in these environments where IHL doesn't really protect you if the government, is, um, in many parts of the world, is criminalizing your ability to work on a side of a conflict that they consider to be um, held by terrorists or those groups that designated as terrorists. Maybe, maybe protecting is a better word rather than securitizing for health workers. Um, the thing is a lot of these ideas sound much or sound really good on paper, but in practice they can be manipulated a bit to work in the favor of the, of the powerful as usual. I mean, that's the world, right? Um, let's not be naive. I think particularly around this wanting to, to 
to reshift um, health into a security arena. Again, positive in terms of greater attention, but it also means that in a lot of countries of the world, the Ministry of Health is really underfunded. Nobody really, they have very little power even within the ministries themselves. The health systems are, are, are weak. So there, and the Ministry of Defense instead is probably much better funded. Right? And they have a lot more resources. And so if there's something bad that's going to come in, some sort of epidemic in particular that will happen, we'll use the military and the military will help sort it out. But that, like I was saying earlier, in many parts of the world, would have effects that are completely unintended that will, in fact, drive an epidemic, for instance, underground. Um, so I think, yeah, there, there's some definite, the way that it can be translated to, to, into action on the field is complicated. Um, definitely agree about the priorities of the Global North. Um, that's actually one of our big, our big concerns about it. And in fact, I would say our recommendations in the whole, the whole package around global health security is about protecting people and not borders. Um, it's about making research and development accessible and affordable for these new tools to, these, to, uh, to everyone. Um, and it's definitely about making sure the priorities aren't just led by wealthy donor nations and that it's actually led, again, by the patient's needs. Um, it sounds nice, um, again, it, but it often ends up on paper rather than in practice, which is what measles also tells us a bit about. Um, what else, where did we say? Um, I think I'll leave it there. Would you continue? Uh, should I just go ahead? Yes, and I, I would, all these three questions for me are um, directing um, at the, the question how to improve our response and have we learned something from, from earlier um, events like 2014-15. Um, there are, uh, first of all, I would like to repeat what I said earlier. We have to find solutions which are adapted to the respective crisis. There are differences. It was mentioned the example of, of Syria, where we have a different situation from the situation in, in Eastern Congo. So the approach should be um, oriented at the population which is disease-stricken. And what we need is a comprehensive approach. And there, I think, there is something we learned from before. There is at least some progress to be seen in comparison to the reaction in 2014 15 in Western Africa. Um, we know nowadays it's not only about the vaccine, it's not only about medical care, but it's about how to approach a population. And therefore, we need much more that, than only sending medicamentation or vaccines. We have to take into account, as Heather said it earlier, the, the aspects of the population and their fears or wishes, which takes some time. And um, part of this, it is now being reflected in when it comes to, to Congo and our response to Congo in the new strategic response plan for, for the months between July till December, where we not only look at the aspects of medical aid, but where we include further aspects how to approach a population, how to go there to, first of all, you need to talk to the elders of a group or a tribe to get them involved. It's not just send a team of doctors with a needle and vaccine the people. No, we need more. In that sense, I completely agree with Heather. It's, of course, would be a slow approach, but we need the consent of the population without the population will not be able to control the, the um, outbreak. And I would rather, because that, that what was mentioned earlier, I think by Mr. Westphal, the question of um, the international humanitarian law and how to deal with, with the different actors, also military actors. That is part of this call for action we have introduced and initiated in, in New York in the Security Council, that it's about teaching all different actors what international humanitarian law means and how to abide by this, trying to get practitioners together and to learn from former activities 
how to improve, um, and that concerns all actors. So what I believe is the, the solution in improving the, our response is a comprehensive approach, and it's cooperation. Cooperation between different governments, between governments and the international institutions, but specifically, and there we come back to the approach, which is the approach to the population, um, include uh, local communities, include civil organizations, and the cooperation goes for me further and beyond that. We have now a difficult and different situation than maybe a couple of years ago. We have so many actors in the field. We have to um, also to include like private sector and others who are in one way or the other involved in this initiative. So cooperation is for me one of the keys and comprehensive approach. Thank you. Uh, Christian, maybe you want to answer. I think the health system strengthening question statement was yeah. not absolutely addressed yet. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm just on, um, um, I come to that. I just want to say uh, one, one sentence to Mr. Westphal about the healthcare in danger or let's say the, the destruction of, of health facilities, what we heard in the panel before that was very, very, let's say, touching and uh, compelling. Um, I think there is, there is no easy answer for that. And I think all the people that are here will not be the ones who will really bring um, a, a solution for it. Um, I, I, what I heard from the panel before is something uh, getting, a, a count, uh, let's say, those acts accountable. Um, so which means it has to be traced, it, uh, tracked, traced, documented, and, 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 and let's say don't forget it uh, so and, 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 and get those people accountable. This is, this is one, if that is truly done consequently, I think that might be one step. Another, but um, this is an erosion of, of let's say, of our uh, humanitarian or human values um, um, worldwide, and uh, that was also mentioned in many, many uh, forums as well. So, but no easy answer to that. But uh, I think this has this topic needs to be uh, be placed very, very prominently in health uh, and security debate. And now to the health system strengthening. I think uh, this is the absolute core if um, if you want if you if you really believe in health and security um, then it, it, there is no way um, other than uh, strengthening a health system in wherever um, and um, and and it, as it was said once a disease or um, uh, something um, yeah disease is labeled with uh, let's say a security concern Boom! You see a huge, um, let's say, increase of funding um, uh, and a diversion of also resources. Uh, but basically, there are vertical programs uh, that are not really helpful for for to support that kind of health system strengthening. So we have to be a little bit more resistant um, to go for the easy answers um, and and um, and think a little bit more. Uh, horizontally and long-term sustainable um, and, uh, and, and absolutely um, health systems uh, strengthening should be the core um, of uh, the health security concept. Thank you very much. With an eye on the time, I would have two more super quick, super specific questions. There's one, the lip, and there. Sorry, let's start. Let's start here, and then it's you. Okay, thanks, um, Philip from MSF Germany. So when when the frame of global health security makes us pick the wrong priorities, like measles versus Ebola, and makes us also use the wrong approaches, like securitizing health in very sensitive contexts, and by that cannibalizing the potential additional resources, why exactly do we need it? Question to you. Well, I, 
okay, so um, again, um, if you look at from that point of view, uh, you are absolutely, and this is a very fair uh, question. If you look at from the other point of view and say, okay, and this week comes to the health security agenda, why the global north, they say, okay, we want to protect us. And this is the thing which is the notion that is maybe in contrast to the more the humanitarian approach. So um, um, this is this is the range. So um, it's it's um, we we heard about um, the huge. Um, um, so if if you have the impression this uh, this particular disease or health threat is having an impact on your on your security, you will certainly and this is also legitimate to take some actions to prevent it. This has nothing to do with a humanitarian approach, where you what what you are saying. So uh, keeping both is n neither wrong or right. I think I think we, we just need to to accept that, that there are two angles to see it. Uh, but where we have um, uh, uh, maybe the influence is to, to um, uh, maybe to, to prevent that the whole security concept and uh, is is uh, absorbing all kind of resources, and this is why you, uh, what you are saying you need to, you need to keep saying that. <laughs> yeah, you need. To, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't forget you. But the question was so specific, I had to, sorry. Um, Heather, Mr. Bergner, would you like to comment as well? Um, good point. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the idea behind the global health security agenda to uh, improve surveillance and be able to understand where outbreaks are happening in the world, for instance, is not a bad one. It's a good idea. The point is, though, is that Instead, you should invest them in response, not containment, and that's the, the key bit to it. So it's important to, because it, as I think it was Rob from MSF UK said, the world is not prepared for a big outbreak. That is very clear. And so investing and making sure that we're able to respond to people's needs is important, and we should do that. But the point is, whose needs are you worried about? Who's, how are you going to respond? Are people going to like you for it? Are they going to, make, are they going to be more mad at you after? That's kind of the point. Well, I, I don't have much to add to, to what I have said before. For me, the key is uh, uh, respect for the humanitarian principles, and, and uh, that will guide us in our response to, to humanitarian crisis. Thanks. Yeah, and I think just super quick uh, answer to that question, because it brings attention, so much attention. But it's also a question how to channel the attention to the, to the needs of the people. Yeah. I didn't forget you. Yeah, I'm Mariam from MSF, and my question is to Herrn Bergner. Um, I'm wondering if the German role in the um, United Nations Security Council is so strongly. As a member of the Federal Foreign Office, um, can you maybe comment on Germany's policy towards Turkey or the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and whether these are not global health security threats um, by delivering weapons to these members. Um, I allow me that I'm not commenting now on, on, on the other issues, um, because I, I don't believe that brings us further. We are one of the strongest supporters of humanitarian assistance in Yemen, and that is one of the countries you're talking about. And you may well know that we stopped sending weapons to both countries you mentioned. And I think that should be the answer. Thank you. Thank you. So wrapping up, uh, thank you very much. Maybe we can give like a super quick next uh, last round on, we heard a lot about trust as a core of uh, what we need, community engagement, and also reframing the concept of health security, also health and security, but I mean, that just works. Um, so where, where are we heading? Like what is needed for, for future outbreak responses preparedness? Um, I would, would you like to start? Well, okay, so I have a very quick one. Um, it, is, um, uh, it is 
in artificial intelligence. We need to have a deep learning algorithm to understand much better, um, let's say, um, what is going on to be, uh, to have, to, um, that will have our decision-making process. So I, I see here something coming that um, um, uh, disease uh, surveillance and also preparedness, that uh, that kind of uh, uh, technology will really help us and, and will, uh, let's say, will um, enter, uh, will stop a lot, of, a lot of conversation that we had in the past. Okay. Thank you. New aspect, but thank you, Mr. Bergner. Thank you very much. Um, as I said before, I think cooperation is the major answer between different, different actors. And uh, we have to look for a comprehensive approach. I, I think it's very helpful that the report of the newly established Global Preparedness Monitoring Board had been mentioned um, that said clearly we are not prepared for a major outbreak of uh, um, um, a disease like the, uh, we had the, the infectious um, influenza disease in 1918 till 1920. We are not prepared for such an outbreak. So the situation is not that there's one clear-cut answer to the question how to, to strengthen our response. There are many elements to it. One is, of course, strengthening health systems and to look at the overall situation when we come to, to Ebola, it has been mentioned in, in, in Congo, we have the problem that we have to gain the trust of the population and that is another key point we have to, to focus on. Heather, you have the last word. So I'll, I'll finish as I started. So for us, health security should be about securing the health for everyone, no matter who you are and where you, where you live. Um, we need to collaborate with people and we need to respond to individual medical needs. Respect the dignity of patients and their families. Don't treat them as threats. Treat them as people who deserve help because they're people and that's all. And be a trustworthy partner so that people do want to come to you for help. Thanks. Thank you very much, which is for me basically the definition of the right to health. Um, uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for engaging. Um, and let's give a clap to this panel.